Good evening or good morning for some of you. Welcome to our Beyond Imagination Talent Track Skills of the Future, taking us beyond our imagination to predict new roles, new skills and new ways of working. Now let's start off with a round the table introduction. So I'll start. My name is Judy Dark, as I've said, and I am the Chief Communications Officer here at Technicolor Creative Studios. Let's move on to Dave. Yes, hi, my name is Dave Taratero. I oversee the Disney live action visual effects for uh, the, the live action motion picture group at Disney. Um, been working in visual effects for around 27, 28 years now. I've seen quite a bit of change over the years. Uh, we've started, you know, when we used to film things out on film and look at things on a cam and a moviola to now where we're kind of interacting, you know, in headsets, scouting virtually and shooting things on a stage where there's actually nothing in front of you. Uh, you're just kind of using monitors in virtual production to kind of create a film. It's been a great, quite a journey, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Thanks very much, Dave. Let's come to you next, shall we? Shall we? Let's go. Should we go? It's Matthew next. Hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Drinkwater, head of the Innovation Agency at London College of Fashion, where I have a, a really awesome remit to explore any emerging technology and its impact on the fashion and retail industry. So. What we try to do is build proof of concept and prototypes with that technology to show to the fashion industry how technology can change the way that you can create a collection, showcase a collection or retail a collection and hopefully accelerate the pace of change in the industry. And then we bring a lot of that knowledge back into the university itself and filter it through to our student base. So hopefully we send out a new generation of talent within the fashion and retail world with a a much greater understanding of emerging technology than perhaps a, a current crop of executives might have. Thank you, Matthew. Alicia, let's come to you next. Hi, um, thanks for having me. I'm Alicia Lidecker, uh, Global Director of Creative Technology here at the Mill. Um, so in part, I help to work with the internal teams who are looking to how we're going to build experiences that really leverage different types of emerging technologies from AR, VR, IoT, robotics. Um, we work a lot with a lot of different brands across um, a, a very large number of type of use cases. Um, I think we'll probably all agree that we're having a lot of people coming to us saying we want to build something for the metaverse. Uh, and what does that mean exactly when we're saying that we want to build for the metaverse? But um, it's really great to have a number of amazing creative technologists to work with to really understand what's possible in the emerging tech space and what works best for different experiences to build with it. Great, thank you. Uh, and then last, let's come to you, Richard. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm Richard Southern, and for the last four years, I've been head of the National Center of Computer Animation at Bournemouth University. Uh, it's one of the leading schools for computer animation and visual effects uh, worldwide. Uh, we have about 500 students across our taught and postgraduate research programs, um, 30 members of staff. And I think the interesting thing about the National Center for Computer Animation is what we've always, over the last 30 years, uh, tried to blend, um, or at least our philosophy has always been science in the service of the arts. And uh, we do try to um, leverage technology and uh, research and scientific and computing practices uh, into breaking new ground and, and creating new spaces in computer animation. Great, thank you. So let's let's start by going backwards a bit. And Dave, you said that you've been in the industry for 27 years. So what's changed between the skills that people needed way back when, when you were a, a fresh little thing in the industry and, and now? Well, communication has really changed dramatically. I mean, when I started, I had a pager. Um, some of you don't even know what that is, but that was part of the way that we had to communicate um, when we were filming something out in the middle of the night and the camera broke. Um, I would get a page at two or three in the morning and, you know, you know, kind of being asked what what to do. Should we start over? Should we keep filming out? And the reason that was such a big deal back in the day is that we actually looked at media on, you know, physical media. And we didn't just look at it on a laptop or on a computer playing back in real time. We actually put each frame onto film and it took around 45 seconds uh, to, to, to get a frame onto film and then in the morning it would go to the lab it would get processed and then we would look at it we'd sit around a chem or we'd sit around a moviola which is only a screen like that big the chem is you know a bit bigger 
and we would kind of evaluate the look of our shots. It, it, it was not real time at, at all, and, uh, and it was certainly a, a long, laborious process. And now, you know, we get to you know do this kind of like on the fly as renders get done. They just kind of come onto your laptop all packaged up as a quick time, and you know you can kind of have a much more interactive experience. It's been you know quite an amazing change, actually, just how quickly things have evolved and how kind of collaboratively you can kind of get together, experience things across the world in real time, which in the past would have been like, you know, putting on film, making a bunch of prints, sending it around to different people in different screening rooms. Um, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. Communication, I think, has just been the biggest change, the ability to collaborate remotely and communicate together. Uh, Alicia, how much of that sounds familiar to you and what's changed since you've been in the, the, the industry, presumably not for 27 years? Um, still not too far off from it, but yeah. Um, <laughs> my background is more from the engineering and coding side. So uh, when I think back actually to when I was studying computer science many years ago, um, most of us didn't even have computers. So we were coding on paper, pen and paper. Uh, which I don't even know how like professors were actually grading and seeing like, do you have all your semicolons at the end if you're doing stuff in C++ on paper? Uh, but now if we look to today, there's so many different tools and pipelines that exist to really help automate things. I think, um, you know, if we look back to many years ago, it was very developer focused and now it's very creator focused and really thinking about how do we create tools to bring in different types of skill sets and different types of people from different backgrounds to create for this industry of um, new emerging tech without the pain points that many of us had to go through um, many years ago. Nice. And, and Richard, obviously, as, as, as an educator, so what's the direction of travel for skills in the industry? What, you know, and what does that mean for education? Yeah, so um, I think this, this is a long question. I, I have uh, a couple of thoughts on this. Um, so in terms of specific technologies, we're seeing in the short term a uh, big shift towards, towards real time. I'm sure everyone is um, familiar with uh, uh, Unreal um, and soon it will, and Unity, Zero Point, and others, other platforms, uh, Notch, which are which are platforms designed for uh, real time content. Um, and, and I think uh, we're treating it a bit like another renderer. I mean, we, we've always supported multiple renderers. Um, we're treating Unreal workflows currently as a bit like a, another renderer, but I think it's going to become uh more central uh in vfx and computer animation production another thing which is um perhaps in the longer term is i think of um, asset libraries uh becoming more of a, a thing uh we're, we're we're teaching our students to interpret briefs and create novel assets that, that meet the requirements of a production but actually i think the the quality of the assets that you can get um either um procedurally through uh, meta humans or um, from libraries um, such as Quicksil are are probably going to become the mainstay, the bread and butter of most productions going forward. And I think we, we may look at um, repositioning what our students will end up doing in the future. And I think even longer term, um, we are looking more at machine learning and artificial intelligence as the core tool of the practitioner of the future. And that will mean that uh, instead of them creating assets, they're going to need to start thinking about cataloging and building databases and structuring uh, data so that they can generate assets. And I think that's going to be quite a big shift to to what a VFX and a computer animation practitioner will be doing in the future. But that's five plus years in, in, in the future, I suspect. Uh, and Matthew, what do you think, what technologies do you think will be will be influencing the future? I mean, you've been talking about all of the you know exciting stuff that you do where you are, but but what's coming? What can we look forward to? I, I think it's really interesting hearing everyone else talk because of that huge changes that the industries uh, that we all work across have seen. And yet the fashion industry has always positioned itself as an early adopter of technology. And yet really nothing could be further from the truth. I think there is a, a genuine resistance to change within the fashion industry and a, a desire to cling to traditional ways of making and traditional ways of showcasing uh, and heritage being uh, particularly on the luxury side of it being something that people are holding very fast to and you know that digitization of the industry that we have been working on and pushing for you know the last 10 years or so is 
we started on a very practical note of look we can create garments in in 3d design software and whatever package you might be using there's a there's a very practical use for that within supply chain and minimizing waste and sustainability all of these themes which are are really going to be very crucial for every industry that we work in and and yet um still so little adoption and and very slow to to realize the opportunity and and for me i think the last couple of years and the onset of the pandemic has been the realization that actually digitization is going to play a big part not just in creation of assets but communication of them too once you have that 3d asset that you can begin to deploy and create new experiences new product for consumers that doesn't need to be physical and i think it's that that pipeline of technologies that we'll see more brands beginning to create in 3d finally um but also beginning to to utilize all of the platforms so for us at the college it's it's kind of looking at where 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 do we allow for designers who might be creating natively in digital um, platforms, but also those who are creating physical products? How do we place that into a digital environment? So for us, photogrammetry, volumetric capture, virtual production are all things which will be absolutely crucial for how um, we communicate fashion in the future. So, yeah, for us, that's that's kind of the direction of travel um, and we will drag the industry along with us. And Alicia, what what do you think that means as well? That what creative technologies are coming from sort of the effects from the entertainment side of things? What 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 could we add from on that side of things? So almost to just follow up with what you're saying, I love where fashion is going by utilizing new emerging technologies. And for me, it's augmented reality. I love seeing now, like just in the last year, the fact that um, we're starting to get really robust. Um, algorithms to be able to do full body tracking. Like a few years ago, it was just face tracking. So a lot of people thought, oh, augmented reality equals face filters. But now as we're seeing things, especially with through Snapchat, through WebXR technologies that have full body tracking, I am loving the whole kind of like glow up that's happening with the fashion industry. And uh, for me, five, 10 years from now, I would love to see it where, whether it's through glasses or just through mobile, as we're all in this metaverse, that I can have my digital uh, fashion that's been um, created by a fashion designer, but then actually get to wear that in real life and kind of picture having these fantastical garbs and whatnot that is tied to my persona in the real life through augmented reality. So um, huge fan of AR, and I feel like there's a lot of adoption that is being uh, that is happening now around the augmented reality space as things become more and more accessible from a technology side. Um, in the last year, I think brands, especially throughout the pandemic, have seen that WebXR, just being able to scan a QR code, pre-pandemic, not everyone knew what a QR code was. And now I think everyone is aware of exactly what that is and how to utilize it. And we're really seeing a lot of opportunities of being able to tie augmented reality or virtual experiences and where the user can just have that seamless UX of scanning it and getting to see that augmented experience through their phone. So you talked about what life might be like in the future, Alicia. So, so Dave, coming to you, what do you think the industry is going to look like in another 10 or 20 years? That's a that's a loaded question. Uh, 10 Isn't or 20 it? years. Wow. The, the, the scope is uh, five years for me, like when I'm sitting there thinking like 10 or 20 years. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty far time horizon. I mean, right now we're really trying to focus on AI, I think, and how we can kind of tell stories with characters using AI technologies. So I, I can imagine like going on to set in the future, let's just say we were to film Pinocchio 10 years from now, that there may be some kind of a capture that's done with a performer who's imbibed what the director has thought of what Pinocchio should move like. And we go through this rehearsal and this kind of exploration phase of what the character is supposed to perform and, and act like, kind of creating an AI model for that character. And then while you're on set, walking through an Italian village, in real time, you can kind of use some kind of an input device, the game controller or whatever. You kind of pre lidar, you know, the you know photogrammetry or whatever the, the the Italian village. And now, when Geppetto is walking, you know, Pinocchio to school, you you can you can imagine seeing Pinocchio walking right next to him, and you know, kind of having the characteristics uh, that you've kind of pre, you know, informed the character to have. And in real time, see, oh, Geppetto's walking too fast for Pinocchio to keep up, or you know, the way that 
Pinocchio moves in this you know environment is is exactly right or it's just kind of seeing that kind of real time uh, visualization of these characters in in the environment as you're filming these movies i think that's kind of the 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 next phase for kind of characters in films and and the eyeline part of that i think helping cinematographers imagine the speed with which a character moves in frame and the characteristics of what they may do when they jump or whatever that can happen in real time which which right now happens really after the fact or in a clunky previous kind of way. And I'm really excited to see it kind of happen using AI technology in a kind of in a real time situation. And, and Dave, what do you think that means for skills in the industry? What are we going to have to train people to do to be able to, to, to make all that a reality? Well, I think the one good thing about the industry is it's had hundreds, you know, hundred years of experience of like kind of looking at the, the different roles that bring a movie together. And I think if you think about that, those roles are going to exist in the future. I think that, you know, we're going to have a gaffer, but it may be a digital gaffer. We're, we're going to have an art department, but it's going to be more of a virtual art department. We're going to do scouting, but it may be more, you know, scouting in, in a VR experience. So all of those different skill sets and those different um, trades that people bring, you know, such great expertise to the different, uh, you know, filming of, of, of a film. Um, I think that those things are going to, you know, just be more digitally um, approached. So a digital gaffer, we're still going to light an environment when we film a virtual production movie, but now the lights are just going to be kind of in the computer versus actually sticking them up on, on, uh, you know, C stands and whatnot. Oh, and Richard, obviously we want as many of our creators in the UK to go and work for Dave and, and his his crew. So what do we need to teach them? What do we what what does it mean for the for the creative education classroom, um, the new skills they're going to need for the future? Yeah, I think this is a, a really interesting question because the dust hasn't really settled on the, the necessary skill sets um, in virtual production and those types of areas. Um, I think we've, we've kind of settled on a on a philosophy that in some sense, nothing changes, as in they still need to be good visual storytellers. They still need to know how to, or, or they need to know design processes. They still need to know um, cinematography. They still need to know, you know, the, the basics of, of, of storytelling and creating assets that meet the requirements of the production. But I think in, in some ways, I also philosophize that everything changes. They now need to think about everything through the lens of, of um, real time virtual and, and those types of practices. Um, just addressing what Dave was saying. Um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. But one of the things that he hasn't mentioned is also sustainability and uh, the ability for roles to go remote. Um, and, and that's obviously been um, accelerated in the last two years. Uh, but I think that's that's a, something that we may look at um, in the future as, as uh, practitioners move more out of studio and more online and virtual. Um, unless we're going to be really interesting space for for people to operate in the future. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. And Matthew, you, you talked about how disciplines and sectors are sort of intersecting with each other. So uh, and sometimes the boundaries are quite blurred. What do you think that means for new talent looking to find their niche or position in the industry? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think kind of this conversation in itself is one of the things that terrifies my particular industry enormously because there's a sense of replacing skill sets and like I think we will still see traditional fashion created and and the need for it I think there is no suggestion from my part that we'll be really um, replacing physical products but we are going to be creating categories that stand alongside it that give additive value or create a, a new channel for the industry. And so it's those skill sets. And I think what's been fascinating for, for my team has been to work alongside different industries. So I come from the fashion industry, but over the last 10 years, I've spent most of that working with the gaming and the film industry and beginning to pull all of those sec, uh, skill sets together. Like um, I need more students who can create uh, 3D garments. Uh, I then need designers who can create environments in Unreal and Unity. And for the industry to begin to understand what the differentiation is between those different elements is still something which is really missing. So 
I think we we will see a lot more collaboration. The industry and where fashion sits at the moment is that it will be forced to collaborate externally because those skill sets don't exist naturally within a fashion business. Um, but we will begin to see a change in the sort of student that we see. Like 10 years ago, I didn't see anyone who could code in Unreal or Unity. And now I do. And actually, some of them are graduating and coming to work with me, which is really exciting. So I, I want to see more of that. And we are going to see it. And those roles will begin to change, like everyone has hinted. Like I, I think a lot of those existing roles, as Dave touched on, that exist within fashion today will still exist, like art direction um, and photography are all important. But how do those happen in styling? What, how does that happen within a virtual space for virtual product? These are things that will develop and evolve over time and will become important. But it is um, the more that we bring industries together, the, the blurring of those skill sets and the need for people to work together, I think, is really important. Yeah, um, immersive technologies, you know, they are they're changing the scope of things to come. But what does that mean for the critical key skills that the people need to have once they're coming into the industry? Um, I feel like Matthew and Richard both touched on this, but it's really interesting now seeing um, the the some of these creators coming in who you need to know the Unity and Unreal kind of toolkits. Um, for me, I come from gaming and even trying to hire talent in the experiential space, it felt like we always had to go back to the gaming industry to try and find that talent because they were the only type of creators who knew these engines to build for 3D immersive content. Um, but that's where I think like this skill set, it's so great and we're seeing it start to flourish now in universities where we're bringing together creators from different areas, not just gaming. Game engines does not equal just games anymore. Game engines equals any type of emerging tech experience. Um, and that's where I, I'm hoping to see more of that happen from the universities, um, seeing more hackathons where we're bringing together uh, engine developers, so those who know Unity and Unreal, and pairing them with people from different industries so that we can really start you know, people uh, can transfer that that knowledge and that skill set back and forth to each other. Thank you. I'm going to ask all of you now just to sort of think back about your own careers and, and think about you know, what have you learned? What's the what's the one piece of advice or an insight that you could give from your own career path um, or, or that would might motivate a, a, a young person coming into this industry? I'm going to start with you, Dave. Yeah, I guess for me, when I think about like the, the best advice I could give someone, I think it's coming to the table. You know, if you're if you're at the table, have have your voice and you know, be confident in your voice, be respectful with the people that you're there, you're there to collaborate, but you're there because you have a talent and you're there, people want to have you, you know, share what you're thinking and what you know how you would approach something. And so I think coming prepared, but coming confident um, and being ready to collaborate is really, I think, the most important part of you know, kind of the path forward. Richard? I'm not sure anyone listening would like to emulate my career path, but um, <laughs> what I, 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 well, I don't know. I, I came from uh, visualization and electrical, uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, engineering. Uh, so, uh, you know, I came from a rather nonlinear uh, trajectory. I just, I, I, I suppose um, one thing I have learned certainly from uh, being in academia and doing research, uh, but specifically in terms of students. Um, one thing I always that always concerns me is that there's really not enough research done uh, when students pick courses. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, very basic level thing to expect your, your applicants uh, and and leavers to, to have done their due diligence about the types of careers that they're going to be moving into. Because what we see is we see a lag between um, what the industry needs um, and what we're uh, what our student intake is expecting, um, and that lag may be as much as five to ten years. Uh, and it's you know we, we we try our best to 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 claw back and get them to a level where they are employable, but there is a reality that there is a there's a mismatch between what students are expecting to do and what they're expecting their roles to be and what the roles actually are. And in the last two years, we've seen a 
spectacular shift in in the types of roles that that industry is expecting to hire. About five years ago, you would expect to shoot green screen footage and spend a lot of time doing stuff in Nuke, right? That's gone. I, I think that the post production thing, there are still roles there, but if anything, they are shrinking rapidly, and we're we're seeing a new a new space where where um, you know, the compositors of the past are going to have to be there. The, the, the pre-visualization tech viz, whatever it is, these new roles are going to move them into. They're going to have to be ready for that. And I think that for me is the biggest thing is do your research, figure out what the roles are, figure out through consultation um, what uh, what what's expected in the future and target your career prospects accordingly because yeah we, we see too many students coming in thinking that the, the sector still looks like it did five years ago what would you say alicia i say my my advice is always be curious um and to me if i look at my career i started in web dev to product dev to jumping to game dev to augmented reality to uh, working in the XR experiential space. And right now I am like full in on this web three side of things. Like it's so new, it's so fresh. And I'm really excited to see how this decentralization of everything is gonna change up everything that we all are doing. Um, but for me, it's um, always try and try new things, keep learning. Um, I think we see that even now our, our the way that we work um traditionally has been changing so much so to me like if you get too much into one area of specialization that's it's things are going to change so for me it's um always learning and be curious about what's new in the industry and, and alicia you said that everyone's always asking you about the metaverse so, <laughs> yeah how would you explain the metaverse to a, a new little a new student just coming out of one of our out of the academy I feel like we could do a one hour again, just talking about that. But I'll say like, for me, the metaverse is really this idea of being able to have experiences that exist in any virtual space, um, whatever cross platform uh, the user chooses, but then being able to have that experience exist in the physical space as well. And that to me is why I'm so excited about augmented reality, different types of technologies to bring experiences to the physical world so that this opens up experiences to a much larger audience. People can experience things in the real world if they're physically able to be there, but also get to experience things in the virtual world. Thank you. Matthew? Oh, Julie, I can hear the voices of mum and dad shouting up to my bedroom saying, get off your computer. Kids, don't get off your computer, stay on your computer and keep playing video games. Um, I, um, I, <laughs> I think also that the thing which has really changed dramatically is like the, the tools available to individuals now are so readily available. If you have a decent computer and a good internet connection, you can do this anybody can do this and also i think what that does is it opens up to a, a community where you'll find like-minded people where you can collaborate with others the nature in which we used to create fashion and communicate fashion is going to change beyond recognition in the next five to ten years so i think more than ever there's there's a huge opportunity for young creatives to alter their their journey and their path in a way that was never possible before so yeah enormous opportunity keep playing your video games kids Great. and what's the one thing that excites you most about the future um then let's start with you richard um it's hmm, about the future well well i think we've been predicting convergence between rendering technologies for for ages and i think we're still a bit of a way off of rendering a realistic looking person uh, in real time but um and actually to be honest i'd argue that digi doubles if you if you if you watch closely uh, you'll always spot a digi double a mile away um uh, so so i think uh, i i think i'm really looking forward to seeing characters that, that, that you know we've passed maybe uncanny valley or nearly there but i really look forward to seeing characters on screen um like really good virtual characters on screen um you know there's a lot of research being put into this and um i, I just think that's that's really where we've got to be um and it, for me that's the holy grail like once you've cracked really good real-time virtual characters you you've kind of done it you've gone real time 
Dave, can you always spot a digi double? I bet you there's some digi doubles which we can't see. I, I think we've done a couple. <laughs> oh, you're going to touch I do that. agree. That... You're a digi double, Dave. You're a digi double right now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm not even here. <laughs> no, I agree. That? I think the one thing for me is uh, I would really love to see a more physics based um, performance, you know, as opposed to just um, keyframe animation or motion capture. I feel like, you know, kind of incorporating some physics into the way someone walks across uh, a landscape that has uneven terrain or jumps up onto a, a wall or onto a rock or whatever. I feel those types of motions are still, you know, I yes, you can pick those out. Uh, but you know there are some some shots in some movies that I think look pretty pretty darn good. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe Mowgli did a few things in Jungle Book that you didn't quite realize were uh, you know digi doubles or Corella did a couple things maybe uh, in, in in Corella that maybe weren't you know obviously digi doubles. So hopefully they stuck by. Um, but yeah, I think that for me, I, I think the most exciting part of like what the the future is kind of going to bring is. Um, more platforms for people to be creative like I you could imagine like going to the Uffizi you know you've gotten many many times but now you know this time you know maybe Banksy has kind of done a, an installation there where you're putting on your AR glasses and suddenly you're going to get his take on how you know you would look at a Caravaggio or something like that and and, and maybe he's augmented the painting or the surrounds around it um, and you could have like a whole immersive day going through the museum that's kind of evolved involving his you know vision of what that could be or even more basic if you go to the theme park and you're really into star wars and you want to you know have it be star wars day for you and you're a kid you know the millennium falcons flying into the most easily spaceport at, you know right in real time across the sky while you're at the park and the the new droid from a star wars film is kind of you know walking down main street um and it's kind of like happening you know in your world as you're kind of at the park and you're having those experiences i just feel like that kind of ar experiences is something that is going to be super exciting in the future um and we'll just add another layer of um experience when you're at these different different places i'm, I'm excited about that amazing alicia what are you excited about um, I think similar to what both of you are both saying, to me, it's the idea that um, I'll be living in a world that's very personalized to what I want to see in the world around me. And from an AR side, it's similar to the use case you talked about Star Wars, but maybe in my case, I want to have an education filter that is always on. I'm walking down the street and I get to cross like these amazing virtual beings from history who are walking alongside me and teaching me about the world around me. Uh, I get to see beautiful visuals that I get to interact with. What I learned from that, I might have an, uh, a system that is reminding me like, come back in, learn more about this thing you crossed today. I love the idea that to me, I'm always learning. I can interact with the world around me. Um, I get to personalize it to see what type of content, the visual style that I want. And really, um, it, it, it's the, ro the world that I get to customize around me and uh, get to share with others as well. I see. Matthew? Are you kidding me? Dave just said I get to live in Star Wars. That is what <laughs> I'm most excited about. <laughs> Come I didn't realize you had that sweatshirt on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I think this is the the key difference. This is placing people within our stories. This is making every experience more immersive. That the the emotional reaction that we can engage, like watching watching films, watching media, watching a fashion show, has always been an emotive experience. And now we're able to use these technologies to evoke a reaction which builds a connection. We already know through our research that um, immersive experiences build a connection with consumers. They feel much closer to a design or to a uh, whatever IP that you're you're working with, that we can really build something that a connection that feels much closer to, to people, feels much more believable, which feels like you're part of it. I think that that is the start of a really really exciting journey i think for whatever industry you're working in and for fashion that means placing consumers into um the the world that they love and that they feel excited and connected to so yeah that that's what i am most excited about. brilliant are there any questions you'd like to ask each other um so i mean I 
I, you asked me about kind of educational training requirements. Uh, you know, information I have is that there's a shortage of everything. Um, but but you know, I, I just wanted to hear from Dave and Alicia maybe if they they have any pointers about um, where the current pinch points are, uh, where the needs are. Um, you know, what what are you guys what are you guys looking for in terms of talent and skills? Alicia, do you want to go first? Just, Come on, Dave, you go first. I mean, for me right now, I think yes, there is a huge pinch point, and it's 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 actually still a lot of the tried and true, you know, visual effects roles. You know, new compositors are still, you know, <laughs> very much needed. <laughs> so we are, you know, having, a, you know, a, a, the industry spend has just gone through the roof. Um, you know, it was it's it took a huge dip during the pandemic, but we have come back doubly as strong. And um, those seats um, at facilities are empty, and it's really the capacity concerns are huge. So if you are a compositor, you're a you know a, a Maya artist, Houdini, you know any of those roles are still super critical, and they're great you know fun jobs. I mean you know getting to animate a lion in The Lion King or you know Pinocchio uh, you know you know in an Italian village. I, I don't know I just think those are kind of like the modern day you know. Um, you know, golden age of animation type of jobs, and we're we're really exploring these types of characters in right now. Um, so I think um, those standard roles, and then the emerging the emerging roles, definitely you know knowing your Unreal, your Unity, your game engine technologies, those are going to be the things for the future um, that is now, but kind of get you know more and more and more those roles will need. But we still need the tried and true, uh, and and there's. Lots of great opportunities out there. Anything to add, Alicia? Um, yeah, I would say uh, exactly what you said, finding the developers you know or the creators who can work in Unity Unreal. It's difficult because it's still daunting, um, these engines, especially if you've never worked in them before. Diving into it is, you know, there's great education and great tutorials that exist, but it, it's a bit of a beast diving into these game engines. So um, would love to get more developers who can level up there. But on our teams, we find that um, bringing in creators, especially on the augmented reality side, who have kind of started with learning the Spark AR engine, the Lens Studio engine, they're a lot more accessible and digestible to be able to go in and start understanding the concepts of what is 3D, um, what are assets and how do you build assets for real time and for augmented reality, because creating assets for real time is a is very different to creating traditional assets for a linear film. So I feel like that's a really great, uh, almost like gateway into like learning the real time engines. And from there, looking at potentially WebXR and eventually diving into the more mega engines like Unity and Unreal. So how would you all sum up in one word what's great about doing what you do? Matthew. In one word? One word, that's all you're allowed. God, I, I don't think I can do one word, but um, but I, I guess what is most exciting is that whoever comes into fashion has that opportunity to to build the, the future industry. That's that's what they can do. And we just need to pull them away from Dave and Alicia and, and those guys and, and give them the opportunity over here. This is going to be that war for talent that we need them all. <laughs> and we need them now. Okay, failed in one word. Let's try someone else. Richard, one Most. word. Can it be a hyphenated word? Mm, yeah, all right then. Okay, so problem solving uh, is what I do all the time, whether it's uh, figuring out why a student's code's not compiling or whether it's uh, figuring out which cable to plug into my camera and my motion capture system, whatever it is. So problem solving and anyone entering this industry has to be really adaptable and good at it because um, that's what you've got to do day to day. Thank you, Alicia. Say imagination, because uh, I think once you dive in and can really learn like the basics of emerging technologies, like I know it's cheesy to say, but really like your imagination is your limit for what you can build. And again, it's no longer just about where that these skills bring you to be able to make games. These skill sets allow you to create emerging and um, experiences across all different verticals. And by the way, Matt, 
I would love to help on the fashion side. So we, our team should collaborate. <laughs> I shall introduce you both. I'll introduce the two of you for sure. Dave, what's your one word? I think uh, my one word would be collaboration. I think that it's a great uh, business to collaborate. Uh, you're, you're not going to do it all by yourself. I think there's great, great storytellers. There's great technology folks. Uh, there's great, you know, people who can bring, you know, a sense of space and, and art direction, um, they, you know, and bring all those people together and collaborating and creating something wonderful, I think is really the, probably the, the for me, the most rewarding part of the day to day part of my job is just seeing how people come together and make such great content and great storytelling um, through collaboration. So I think the message is if you're a great collaborator and you've got a great imagination, you like problem solving and you really want to build stuff, then this is the place for you. So that's uh, that's what we need to tell everybody. So thank you. You've, you've created a nice strap line for us at the end of the session. So. Thank you all so much for taking part. There's some really interesting thoughts and ideas there. Um, we have to wrap up now because we're out of time. But uh, as I say, thank you all so much. You've, you've shared so many insights and stories and it's been absolutely great. Loved your predictions, loved your words at the end. And uh, thank you all very much. So stay tuned. Our next track tomorrow will be about how you can step into the VFX and animation industry and what training you're going to need to succeed. Bye for now. Thank you for watching. And, and please, 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 Join the rest of the festival because there's loads of great stuff going on. Thank you.